Well, last week we looked at the beginning of Galatians chapter 2. Paul and Barnabas and Titus, their trip to Jerusalem to defend the gospel. I titled the sermon, Vindicating the Gospel, Part 1, and we'll do Part 2 today. Paul was dealing with the accusation that the gospel that he was preaching was wrong, that it was somehow incomplete, or it was somehow truncated, or it didn't go far enough. And their argument was that the true gospel needs to include at least an element of ceremonial obedience, and in this case, you're talking about circumcision. It needs to include law-keeping. That you've given them a gospel of faith alone? Is that enough to save? And even today, many people who would profess to be Christians would claim, well, look, I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, but then they add, but I still have to be a good person, and hopefully if I don't do anything really bad, I'll get to go to heaven. Well, that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. The gospel never begins with I. Rather, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. The most foundational, fundamental verse that all of our children learn, that is the crux of it, that this is something that God is doing for God so loved the sinful world. Jesus Christ came and died expressly because you and I are sinful to the core, unable of being and doing good, and being dead in our trespasses and sins. We need Jesus to redeem us and to save us, to pay for us, to reconcile us to the Father. He accomplishes salvation. We can't even add a hint of merit to it. Well, how then can a person become saved? Well, it's frankly, like this, by acknowledging their lack of righteousness, realizing their need for Christ and confessing their sins to the Lord. That whole thing I'm describing, that's repentance. A changing of mind for the purpose of changing direction, recognizing in your mind that I have sinned against a holy God, feeling an element of contrition against that sin, that 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 violation of commandment, and then a purposing to say, no, I, this is wrong and I need to obey the Lord. That, that step, that purpose that you have in you, that is repentance. This is not a work yet. You're not doing anything. It's a realization. It's coming to your senses. And then it also includes trusting in the finished work of Christ alone. That is faith. Repentance and faith are the two sides of the same coin that looks to Jesus for life. And by faith, God justifies the sinner. He declares them righteous even though they're not. He justifies them by their faith alone in Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is the message of the gospel. That is the message that we proclaim. It's Paul's gospel. It's our gospel. It's Jesus' gospel. This good news that we have. But there were false teachers in Galatia who were challenging that very gospel. And they were insisting that sinners had to go and do something first. And they were insistent that all of Jerusalem and all the apostles agreed with them and therefore disagreed with Paul. Now, Paul had these kinds of run-ins before. He dealt with these sort of charges, and in opposing them, he got to a certain point when he decided that it was time to go and pay a visit to Jerusalem and settle the issue once for all. And so turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. When the Judaizers arrive in Galatia, the Judaizers are these Jewish legalists who are insistent on not just faith in Jesus Christ, but also an element of circumcision and law keeping. They immediately begin to undercut Paul's authority as an apostle, as well as undercutting his message. In response to the challenge, Paul writes to the Galatian church, he gives them a letter and he's going to answer these charges. In the first chapter and a half, he recounts his own spiritual autobiography, from Judaism to conversion to testimony. And his main point is that he wasn't called to be an apostle by the other apostles in Jerusalem. They didn't take a vote and bring him in. It wasn't anything like that. Rather, Jesus called him to be an apostle. But then he notes, starting in chapter 2, 
that he did eventually, however, go to Jerusalem in order to present and submit his gospel to them, not to have them correct him or to add to him, but rather to clear the air and say, once and for all, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2. Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. And I did so in private to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. It was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing also I was eager to do. And so last week we looked at verses 1 through 5 in this passage, and we are talking about the, the event of Paul and Barnabas and Titus traveling to Jerusalem from Antioch to present their gospel message to see if they would reject it or accept it. It was to, to find out if they were all on the same page, essentially. And we might also note that there is a, a good possibility that this trip in Galatians chapter 2 is in fact the same trip that is being made in Acts 15, which is known as the Jerusalem Council. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not that's the same trip. Scholars, in some regards, are uh, disagreeing with one another on that, but I tend to believe, just based on looking at both accounts, stacking it all up, that these two things are the same visit. But the main issue, before we even tackle that issue, the main issue is this question. What must the Gentiles do to be saved? That's the crux of the matter. What must the Gentile do to be saved? See, the Jews already knew the Bible. They understood sin and sacrifice and atonement. They knew God. They were expecting the Messiah. And so, generally speaking, they were already striving to be obedient to the law of God. They were ceremonially clean, they were circumcised, they kept the Sabbath. They, by all rights, were God's people. That's how they were seen. Then along comes these Gentiles, these non-Jews, these pagans. They didn't know God, they weren't waiting for a Christ, and otherwise they were godless, immoral, unclean, pagan sinners. And they're hearing the gospel for the very first time, and they're, they're cut to the heart, and they, they realize that they're in need of saving. And they're coming en masse, in large numbers. They're coming to Christ through this gospel message. But then the question arises, well, what, what, what must they do to be saved? That's the question that comes up. Acts 15, verse 1, records the Jewish argument And they would say, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And again, in verse 5, it is necessary to circumcise them and, here we go, to direct them to keep the law of Moses. So it starts with circumcision. That's the proverbial camel sticking his nose under the tent. Circumcision is where it starts, but by by four verses later, they're arguing for total circumcision. Obedience to all the law. However, this betrays the understanding. See, here's the thing. They presumed that because they kept the law and were circumcised, they were saved. They were good. They were God's people. But in Galatians 2.4, 
Paul calls these men, pseudodelphus, false brethren, fake Christians. And these fake Christians are trying to bind Titus, who is a Gentile, and trying to make him to be circumcised, to keep the law. However, Paul and Barnabas and Titus would not give in. They didn't yield. But the question is, well, what's the argument against them? Why is the opposition so strong? What what are they using as a tactic? And that's what's dealt with here. The thrust of their uh, their instance, the thrust of their insistence on law keeping seems to be built on the premise that the the prominent apostles, the, the notable leaders, the pillars of the faith, are insistent that this is the way to do it. We have all the big guns on our side. And they say that this is what you have to do to be saved. They're with us. That's their argument. But from Paul's response in verses 6 through 10, it seems here like they're banking on the the celebrity appeal of Peter, James, and John. And Paul makes note of them. He says in verse 6, But from those who were of high reputation, and then he puts in kind of parentheses here, what they were makes no difference to me because God shows no partiality. He says, well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. Now, there's a few moving parts here. First, Paul calls the leaders in Jerusalem those who were of high reputation. He says in verse 2 a little bit earlier that he only refers to them as those of reputation, so a variance on that. But then later in verse 9, he calls them men who were reputed to be pillars. Now, at first glance, when you look at that language, the first glance, it seems like Paul is either mocking them or writing them off. But we know if we look at the rest of Scripture, we know that that's not Paul's tendency. He doesn't really think of them that way. In fact, he highly regards these men. And he refers to himself elsewhere as the least of the apostles, implying that they are all greater than he is in his eyes. And so he doesn't deride these men. He actually holds them in high regard. He esteems these men. So Paul's not mocking them. Rather, he's merely pointing out the fact that they were notable men. That's true. But if there's any hint of condescension, any any hint of sarcasm or, or, or any jibe at all, it has to do with the fact that the Judaizers were here touting the apostles' reputation as leverage to score points for their view. You see that? In essence, they're saying, we were sent by the reputable apostles. We were sent by the notable ones, and not like this disgraced Damascan deserter. We have the big guys. We have the the respected ones. They're on our side. And so if Paul is terse here, it's not because of the apostles, but it has to do with those who would name drop them as if that meant something. Well, how does Paul respond to their references to these famous apostles. Look at what he says. He says, look here, what they were makes no difference to me. They can name drop all day long, but Paul's response is, look, I don't care. It makes no difference to me. And it's not that he doesn't care about their position, but their status really has no bearing on his calling or his ministry. None. And then he adds here, God shows no partiality. Guess what? God doesn't care either. Just because you have celebrity on your side, just because you're famous, just because you're notable, just because you're respected or have degrees on the wall, God doesn't care. As if that could score points with him. He doesn't care. This is reminiscent of Deuteronomy 10.17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods. And the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. You cannot use your celebrity or your status or your fame or your followers or your prominence or your accomplishments to score any points with God. He doesn't care. And it's not that he doesn't care about you. But he doesn't care about what you have to offer as if you could leverage him in your favor. This point is especially poignant in our culture that is addicted to chasing celebrity. We marvel and we 
ogle and we drool over stars and celebrities, over fame, over influence. Especially kids. Kids really struggle with this. They have their social media accounts and they get followers and fans and likes and shares and as if millions of fans can validate you or bring you happiness or save your soul or score points with God. But frankly, God looks at that. He doesn't care. It doesn't influence him in any way. Paul says God shows no partiality. And then he continues, well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. And again, it's tempting to read this as Paul being snarky or condescending. But remember what the argument is. Put yourself back in the argument. The false teachers are claiming that Paul is going off script and defecting from his Jewish roots. And the apostles are now here to straighten him out. But he says, I went to the apostles... I submitted to them my gospel, and guess what? They contributed nothing to me. No additions, no alterations, no subtractions. They gave me no notes, nothing. In fact, in verse 7, they saw, on the contrary, that he had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. The apostles, they contributed nothing because they didn't need to contribute anything. There was nothing lacking. His gospel wasn't truncated. His gospel wasn't incomplete. They affirmed that Paul had the gospel. In fact, they realized that Paul had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. He notes just as Peter had been to the circumcised. Now, some have questioned here whether or not this sentiment sort of illustrates two possible gospels, one to the circumcised or to the Jews, and then another one to the uncircumcised or to the Gentiles. And it seems obvious, I would think, from our study here, that chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, as well as the rest of the New Testament, bears witness to the fact that there's only one saving gospel. You don't have one gospel for this person and another gospel for that person. and there, you know, There's not different messages here. Doesn't matter your social status, your ethnic groups, your culture, your heritage, what country you're in, what age you're born. It doesn't matter. It's the same gospel everywhere. However, there is here a distinction made for the purpose of designating different approaches to ministry. His approach is going to be different. Let me explain this. See, in in the ministry in Jerusalem, that would have looked very different than ministry in Antioch or Iconium or Ephesus or Colossae. Same gospel, same, same message of how to get to the Lord, how to be saved by God, same thing, but it's going to be a different context. For example, in Israel, Jews would have understood discussions about the Bible and prophecy and the law and sacrifices and the Messiah. They, they were having debates about eschatology. I mean, they were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when Jesus was here, they were asking him all kinds of questions about the end of days. Good teacher, if seven men marry this woman, this widow, and they all die off and they go to heaven, and which, one, which wife is she going to be in the resurrection? They're, they're asking all these questions, and they, it's just, it's a whole different level of argumentation. And certainly Jesus dismantles their foolish argument. But their entry point into the gospel is very different than that of a Gentile. For example, the Jews understood what sin was. They got sin. They get that. But they didn't understand, and what they needed to understand is how Jesus forgives those sins by his death, resurrection, and intercession. That it's no longer by the blood of bulls and goats, but it's by the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They would have understood that imagery. Hence why the book of Hebrews was written. This is a very Jewish apologetic. Just like the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew begins with 18 verses of genealogy. Now to a Gentile, and probably to most of us here, genealogy is about as exciting as wallpaper. But to the Jew, this would have been fascinating. They would have have dove into this and, and evaluated this argument. But for the Gentiles... Many of them didn't even know who God was, or what sin was, or what is atonement, at least in terms of the biblical understanding of it. 
What they didn't know, they didn't know that idolatry was wicked. That having two wives was sinful. They didn't know that. They just lived however they wanted. They, they, they made things up as they go. They just didn't know. In Acts 17, for example, Paul, he's on Mars Hill and he teaches these philosophers about this unknown God. They had made up this sort of fake, faceless God and, and Paul sort of seizes on that and he says, well, I'll tell you who this unknown God is. And he begins to explain who God is and who, what the gospel is. And he speaks more generally and more broadly. He doesn't assume anything of them. Doesn't assume anything. Just like us here in New England. I mean, you go to the South, there's sort of a, a cultural Christianity, even though not everybody's a Christian down there. There's sort of this assumed thing. People know Bible stories and they all go to church and they're all Christian, supposedly. Up here, there's no assumed cultural narrative. There, you ask a person if they're a Christian, they say no. Do you go to church? They say, why would I? It's not assumed. They don't know who Jesus is. Very different approach. And so you have to approach a conversation with, with a person like that in a very different way. You start with ground zero. Let me tell you about this God. Let me tell you about who Jesus is. Let me tell you about what that cross is. And this matters here because Paul is being accused of betraying his Jewish roots and teaching the Gentiles to disobey God by not being circumcised. But he argues, look, they don't even know what that means. For them, it doesn't actually do anything. If I were to go and circumcise these people, they would have no idea what I'm talking about, why this matters, why it's such a big deal. And after all, God is concerned with the heart. In the end, even if a Gentile lives more morally than a Jew who is already circumcised, it's better for the Gentile who's living morally. But in the end, the argument still holds, according to Romans chapter 3, that there are none righteous. Even the moral Gentile or the circumcised Jew, it does not matter. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you want to hang me on circumcision, it doesn't mean anything. Especially to the Gentiles. This is also, incidentally, why Paul does not circumcise Titus, but does circumcise Timothy. Ever wonder about that question? Why Timothy and not Titus? Well, in Acts chapter 16, Paul is looking to minister specifically to Jews who are living in Derby and Lystra, and he wants to take Timothy along with him. But here's the hitch. Timothy's dad is a Gentile. His mom is a Jew. Timothy's never been circumcised as a baby. And so if he were to walk into a a Jewish context, and they knew he wasn't circumcised, it would be a stumbling block to them culturally. They couldn't get past that. And so for the purpose of removing the stumbling block, Timothy gets circumcised. But it's not because of the gospel. It's an issue of the weak conscience of the Jews. Same gospel, different approach. And that's why Titus doesn't get circumcised. Because they were mandating that as part of the gospel. He says it's not. But he says here, God worked through both ministries. The ministry to the Jews and the ministry to the Gentiles. Look at verse 8. He says, for he who effectually worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. It wasn't Peter's mission versus Paul's mission. It's not the Jewish mission versus the Gentile mission. Paul says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 1.13, he says, has Christ been divided? He can't split them up and parse them out and say, okay, well, that segment of Christ is for this group and that's for this. It's not a, an issue of which one's better, which one's more effective. He says, no, God effectually worked. God produced results both through Peter's apostolic ministry to the, to the Jews and effectually for my ministry to the Gentiles. And in the end, they came to realize that. They saw it. Not that Paul was working against them, but rather, God had called Paul to deliver the same gospel to different people by different means. Verse 9, And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, he notes, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So in the end, we read here, the, the trip proved successful. Not only was 
the gospel itself vindicated, but Paul and his companions were validated. The Jerusalem apostles recognized that God's hand was in it. He, God's blessing was on them, and he uses the term here, that the grace of God had been given to them. They recognized it, they affirmed it. And then he lists the, the actual men. This is the first time he does this here. He says, these are the men of high reputation. James, Cephas, who we know as Peter, and John. Now some have commented that the, the order seems a little bit different here, doesn't it? In the Gospels, we're used to reading Peter, James, and John. And Peter's kind of the ringleader of this whole group. But here it's different. James is put first. Now which James is this? It's not the James of the Gospels, the, the brother of John, because he died back in Acts chapter 12. Herod killed him. This James is the Lord's half-brother. This is the James who wrote the epistle that we read, James. So he's the one who's ministering in Jerusalem. And by all accounts, he is this, uh, he's a leader of certainly the Jerusalem council and the Jerusalem church. But Paul notes these men are reputed to be pillars. That's their reputation. Now, again, Paul doesn't refer to them in this way to be derogatory. He's not saying these guys are supposed to be pillars. That's not what he's saying at all. But rather, he's referring again to the situation at hand. The people are putting them on unnecessary pedestals. They're lifting them up. They're, they're, these are the celebrities of the early church. But here's how it works. If Christ is the cornerstone and foundation of the church, and we, the believers, are little stones, living stones, the apostles are the pillars, are the ones that help give stability to the young church. In the Jewish context, early Jewish literature, a pillar was an image used to refer to those who are of great importance in teaching. And so a rising star, a, a noble person, a strong teacher, an influential teacher, a good teacher, was called a pillar. And while even today all the apostles are gone, the Lord still, even now, gives gifts to the church in the form of evangelists, pastors, and teachers, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. But even, even now, these pillars, pastors and teachers, these pillars are, are functioning as stabilizers for the church. To help the church navigate through difficult times and to provide them with encouragement in their teaching. And in every generation, really, it seems there are, there are pillars. There are, there are men that God raises up to help and guide the church in the right way. These are not venerated saints. These are not uh, somehow this, this higher class of believer at all. These are men of high reputation, not venerated, but to be appreciated. Men who hold the line. And if you look down through history, I mean, every generation has these men. Have you noticed that? Study church history in every generation, in every context, every, every culture, every country, really. There's always a few leaders who really, who God really uses and, and mobilizes them in a, in a huge way to, to bless the church and help the church. Even in the 20th century, just to give an example, many people regarded D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a, a Welsh preacher, they regarded him to be a pillar of the faith. He was incredibly encouraging. He had a very strong and dynamic expository ministry. And he really towed the line. But he died in 1981. And, and people ask, well, what's next? Who's next? Who's going to raise up and fill Lloyd-Jones' place? And then we get James Montgomery Boyce. And he is used widely and greatly by God, and then he dies in 2000. And the question was, when Jim, Jim Boyce dies, well, who's next? And then R.C. Sproul kind of steps up, and people are blessed by his ministry, and God uses him greatly. And then he dies last year, 2017. And even now the question is, well, well Sproul's gone. What next? Let me tell you, God always has his men. He always has those he uses. In every generation, God raises up pillars to help give the church stability, to help the church, to bless the church, to be a gift to the church. And again, this is, I'm not, I don't want to be dogmatic about this, but you just see this trend over and over again. And in the early church, it was men like James and Peter and John and Paul. God gave these men as pillars. Pillars. 
But these pillars, they meet with Paul and Barnabas. And the Bible says here that they they gave them the right hand of fellowship so that they would go to the Gentiles and then these Jewish brothers would go to the circumcised. What do we mean when we say right hand of fellowship? Well, that was a symbol of friendship and of trust. It was an acknowledgement that a brother or a sister in Christ was accepted. They were, they were brought in and recognized. They were affirmed. They were blessed. Now at this point, the, the case being made by the Judaizers has fallen apart. Totally fallen apart. Because Jerusalem has affirmed not only Paul's apostleship and his message, they've given him the right hand of fellowship. And the reason that Paul includes this story here in Galatians chapter 2 in his letter to the Galatian churches, is to notify them that these Judaizers who are at your churches right now speaking lies against me, they don't have a case. I've already been down this road. Jerusalem has already validated me. They've accepted my gospel. They've affirmed my gospel. And everything you're hearing about me right now is false. I've already, I've already dealt with this issue. It's already settled. These men are apostate. These men are false Christians. The Jerusalem council, though, they did say one more thing to the Apostle Paul and to his companions. And they certainly weren't adding to the gospel. They weren't deriding him. But they do say this in verse 10. Paul notes, They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. Now some have surmised that this comment in verse 10 is proof positive that this is the famine visit of Acts chapter 11. Because Jerusalem was suffering a famine, they needed help, and so delegates were sent to provide this aid. And and so some people think this is is just the the nail in the coffin for the case. Absolutely, this is the reason why. And and it certainly could be, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be. Because living as a Christian in Jerusalem in the first century, there was always going to be problems. I mean, if you were a believer in a largely Jewish context... You're persecuted, your income is going to go down, and as soon as famine hits, there's going to be huge problems. And so there was always this revolving door of need in Jerusalem. And so Paul, you see all of his letters, he's always kind of rallying troops to be giving and to be helping. Look at 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I mean, all of this discussion, he's always got the poor on his mind. But this does serve as a reminder to us. That a justified heart must also become a sanctified heart. That our faith works. Or that we're not simply saved to sit on our hands, but rather that our hands would be used as the hands of Jesus Christ to serve other people. Now, Galatians chapter 2 only really records Paul's appearance before the Jerusalem council. But there was a lot more going on at this meeting more than just Paul's personal situation. And there was more that was going on that was farther reaching. And so I want you to, as we close, I want you to turn with me to, to Acts chapter 15. It's clear in the beginning of Acts 15 that there is a pervasive problem that has to do with Gentile inclusion into the kingdom of God. And the question is, well, do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to keep the law? Now, what we know from verse 12 that Paul gave his testimony, but we also know that Peter speaks up in verses 7 through 9, and he asserted a couple different things. First, he notes that the gospel had indeed gone to the Gentiles. He affirms that. And then he says it was God's foreordained plan. This is not something new, taking us by surprise. And he says that God has already cleansed their hearts through faith, and therefore, what purpose do we have in placing a yoke on them that They're not supposed to bear. And so finally, after the testimony had been given, Paul speaks, Peter speaks, and finally James speaks, the recognized leader of the Jerusalem church, and he says this, verse 13. After they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about the taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. 
After these things I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they may abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from, what, and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, with the whole church, to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren, who are elders, to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number, to whom we gave no instruction, have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from the things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from the things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. After they had spent time there, they, went, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with also many others the word of the Lord. So this is a landmark moment for the Gentile Christians. The Jewish leaders in Israel were encouraging them and dispelling the false teachers. And the question is, well, what about verse 29? Talking about the issues of the gospel, what about 29? It seems like there's some conditions here that they're putting on them. Well, let's look at these real quickly. As to the abstaining from the food that's been sacrificed to idols, well, this is the issue of conscience because they're coming out of paganism. And so for them, having a weak conscience, they were used to sacrificing these, these foods to their idols. And so if they were to go and eat that meat that's been sacrificed, they would have an issue of conscience. They would feel like that's sin, even though it's not. And so Paul and the Jerusalem council, they're, they're essentially arguing, look, you know, don't, just don't eat the meat. Save yourselves the hassle. As for the issue of fornication, again, most pagan cultures were sexually obscene and immoral. And so the command here is to help steer them toward godliness. Look, don't, don't be philandering all around the place. Find a wife, marry one woman, be, be moral. It's going to help you in your walk to honor the Lord. Don't, don't get caught in debauchery. But that's not a condition of salvation. They're not saying the, the gospel includes this plus this. They're saying you are believers and now therefore don't defile yourselves with these other things. But it wasn't legalism. It was about removing stumbling blocks for the sake of the gospel. And in the end, however, they weren't saved by their obedience or by their abstinence. They were, in fact, saved. They were justified by their faith in Jesus Christ, apart from works of the law. But then something happens. Peter comes to Antioch. And he brings with him something very subtle, something very sinister. It begins inside of his heart and it affects the entire church. And so Paul has to deal with it. He deals with it hard. He deals with it fast. He deals with it extensively. And we'll look at that next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the grace that is given to us in the gospel. And I pray that you would help us to
be obedient to the call to not forsake the gospel, to not defile it, to not corrupt it, but to know it and to keep it. Help us, Lord, to obey you and to walk in righteousness as those who have been justified. And I pray that as we continue that this would bear fruit and help the church. We thank you again for the grace that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.